Yes, thanks for that. Um, I'm very happy to be here, although on short notice, I'm uh, uh, just a stand-in, essentially. Uh, but thanks to Professor Lin for uh, inviting me. And today I will talk about uh, something that we have relatively recently started doing in my group, which is uh, developing electronic structure theory for open molecular systems. So what do I mean by open systems? What, when I'm talking about open systems now, I'm going to talk about open in terms of flow of electronic charge or electrons to or from some environment. So how is a molecule open? So if we consider a closed system, we can always de decompose it into two subsystems, where the Hamiltonian for the closed system can be written as a sum of a part that only touches subsystem A, a part that touches subsystem B, and then, of course, the coupling or interaction between the two. But suppose we're only interested in system A. Let's say system A is a molecule of interest or a part of a molecule of interest, and B is some surrounding that we want to sort of have in there but treat in perhaps a more approximative fashion. Then we can make an efficient or an effective Hamiltonian for A by tracing out subsystem B, and so we get a Hamiltonian that works uh, only in the molecule A and then the sort of a, um, a coupling to, to the environment. And this coupling to the environment, it, since it contains the interaction with system B, then it will contain some, for example, particle-conserving interactions like the interaction between electrons in your molecule and electrons in your environment. But it can also contain what we can call particle-breaking interactions. So essentially, interactions that see to a flow of charge between the two systems. And that means that this, um, this operator here, the coupling to the environment, does not commute with the electron number operator for system A. Uh, and for us developing wave functions, that of course has some consequences, because now the number of electrons in the molecule of interest is no longer a conserved quantity. And that means that the electronic wave function that we develop should not be an eigenfunction of the number operator. This is uh, uh, fundamental uh, or basic physics from introductory courses, only commuting observables or commuting operators can have simultaneous eigenfunctions. So we'll talk about sort of particle breaking open systems in which the average number of electrons for the molecule or the system of interest can be fractional. It can also be integer, but the thing is that there is a non-zero variance in the number of electrons, since the wave function now is not an eigenfunction of the number operator. So why would we do electronic structure theory for open systems? Well, a purely theoretical construct where it could be useful is to consider uh, if we have a large molecule, uh, but we're only really interested in some subregion of it. And, uh, this is uh, a lot used in uh, electronic structure today, like multi-level or embedding methods to reduce computational cost and to be able to treat some parts more accurately than others. But these two, this system can then be viewed as two open systems coupled to a closed system, and we could in fact treat this sort of as an open system in the presence of a perturbation. Uh, or of some environment. But of course, together they have to be a closed system as long as the molecule is considered isolated. A more fun example, perhaps, is from molecular electronics, where you use molecules to connect electrodes, and then you can put on a voltage to get a non-equilibrium situation where you get transport of electrons from some source to a drain. And here, to be clear that there is no reason why this molecule should be in an eigenstate of the number operator. And uh, in molecular electronics, there has been a lot of developments using a non-equilibrium Green's function theory in combination with density functional theory. And they're doing quite a lot of uh, interesting applications and predictions to what uh, sort of 
how this molecule behaves or how you can tune properties of this junction. Uh, but I think there is merit in trying to develop uh, accurate electronic like wave function theories for this molecule, because at some point I'm pretty sure we want to also access properties like excited state properties or other things that we have a very um, well-developed framework from, from wave function theory. And then there's uh, a, a third more sort of uh, uh, esoteric example is if you want to look at ex ensembles of molecules or averages over molecules which can be in different charge states, then that average would also be a fractional state depending on how many are of the, the, the different charge states. So whereas each single molecule is in a, a particle conserving state, if they have different charges, then the average of it will be fractional. Uh, so those are just three sort of uh, top of the head examples. And of course, there's also the thing about gearing towards examples that we haven't yet thought of, which is the future. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, having this kind of open molecular system view of things can uh, open some new doors. So, uh, when we develop now, uh, started developing theory for uh, open molecular systems, I have been working after a guiding principle. And that is to stay close to and be sort of analogous to the developments that we have from closed system electronic structure theory. And that is because there have been decades of fantastic developments for closed systems where you have uh, uh, approaches to do wave function analysis, either visually or quantitatively. Uh, there's a full set of uh, properties you can compute, like how the molecule reacts to a given fields. Uh, we know how to do accurate correlated models. They're well known. Uh, their disadvantages and advantages are well known. Um, but also there's the practical issue of having a large code base designed for closed systems and we want to be able to reuse that when we tackle open systems. So, uh, what I will talk about today is, is uh, just a small part of what we've been doing. Uh, I will talk about the mean field description for an open molecular system and only in closed shell, and also give a taste of the starting point for how we think we want to do response theory because this is all very new, so we're, all, we're sort of still in an exploratory phase and trying to figure out what are the best ways to do things. And what I will not talk about is sort of our developments within open shell descriptions um, and uh, correlated descriptions, and I will not uh, touch sort of specific forms of the Hamiltonian for various applications, because whether this uh, this coupling part to the environment will look very different on whether you're do dealing with molecular electronics or if you're dealing with sort of a multi-level approach uh, for an efficient description. But I will not go through that. I will just stick to a very simple form of the Hamiltonian. In fact, the simplest form that we can have for a particle breaking uh, system that is closed shell. So uh, that is, uh, I'm just going to give you basically a taste of this, uh, this type of wave functions. So uh, I'll briefly go through the parameterization that we use for the closed shell state. We use a unitary parameterization where we act with a unitary operator on a Slater determinant which has a given number of electrons. So this Slater determinant here is in a particle eigenstate. Let's say it has n electrons, and then we act on it with this uh, unitary operator, which is made out of some two-body creation operators and then some uh, wave function parameters. And uh, the result of this is that the wave function we generate will be a linear combination of Slater determinants, which have 0, 2, 4, 6, et cetera, a number of electrons. In principle, you can have as many electrons as you would like, if you have, uh, like, whatever you choose your basis to, will set how many, how's the maximum number of electrons you can have. 
Not that all are relevant, of course, but that is, uh, that is a task for, uh, for, for example, optimization, which I will uh, uh, briefly touch upon uh, later. But so this is, this is sort of our starting point wave function, is this psi here. And since it's a linear combination of slater determinants with different number of electrons, it's obviously not an eigenfunction of the number operator, so it's a particle breaking state. And this is uh, from work that we have just uh, a month ago submitted, uh, work that I did together with my uh, PhD student Regina and a postdoc Sarai uh, at, uh, at NTNU. So let's just briefly look at the, how the one electron density matrix uh, looks for such a system. And the density matrix now is basically parameterized through these operators that enter the exponential here. You see the gamma operators, the parameters, they enter here on the diagonal uh, of the diagonal density matrix in terms of cosine squared and sine squared. And these are fractional due to the particle breaking nature. And uh, we, we call this the mean field state because there is, there is no way to choose these parameters in a way such that you get a particle conserving wave function that contains correlation in any electron correlation in any form. So that's why we call it sort of the mean field particle breaking state. And now we're not dealing with an ex uh, exact number of electrons, so we're dealing with an average number of electrons, which is give, just given by the trace of this density matrix. Uh, and in the energy that we're also going to look at soon, uh, we, there's another sort of type of density matrix that appears, which is a, what we call a, a pairing density matrix. And the, the name pairing comes from... Um, from uh, related theories in physics, uh, like hartrick fock pogoliobob and pardeen cooper schrifer theory, where sort of you have pair correlations. I will uh, uh, explain that in the next slide. But for now, we have essentially two density matrices that uh, gives us the energy. It's the conventional one, one might say, and then this pairing density. So if we look at the energy, we start out with the Hamiltonian. Uh, the one circled in blue here is the uh, molecular electronic Hamiltonian in second quantization uh, notation, and the one which we, uh, we are familiar with. There's a one electron term here, one electron interactions, then we have two electron, two electron parts. And if we take just this part of the Hamiltonian, so the particle conserving part, if you'd like, uh, of the Hamiltonian and take the expectation value with respect to our particle breaking state, then this is what uh, results. We have something here that is, it's not the hartree fock energy, but the energy expression looks like the energy expression from hartree fock theory. So there is, a, there, except that now it's with a density that has fractional occupations. But the particle conserving part of the Hamiltonian also yields this extra thing that is something that you will not see uh, in a hartree fock energy expression. And it's like an exchange-like term in terms of the pairing density matrix. Um, and this is in fact uh, very similar to, to, the, to this uh, hartree fock Bogoliobov I was talking about, uh, which I will talk about in the next slide. But then we have this very simple parameterization of a particle breaking Hamiltonian, uh, <clears throat> where we just parameterize in terms of a single parameter for each orbital that then captures sort of the interaction with the environment. Um, uh, and that gives an additional contribution to the energy. So what is worth noting about the energy? is that, as I said, this particle conserving part of it is similar to that of hartree fock bogoliev theory from physics. This, is, this part here is similar to that. In fact, it looks exactly the same. However, unlike for the systems they usually treat in physics, where you have attractive interactions between particles, electrons repel each other. 
And since electrons repel each other, it means that for electrons, this term here will be repulsive. So if you don't, if you imagine having just this part of the energy, so just a particle conserving Hamiltonian, then if you optimize your wave function, then the optimization will take you to a state where the pairing density is zero and you have the standard Hartree-Fock solution. And that means that only the particle breaking part of the Hamiltonian can drive fractional occupations. And that is sort of in line with uh, uh, how one would like it to be in physics, because you wouldn't want to get a particle breaking state if you're optimizing the energy for a particle conserving Hamiltonian. And this is sort of in line with that picture. Only if you have a particle breaking part will the, um, will the wave function be particle breaking. And that is what drives the fractional occupations. So in passing, I think it's worth to note that uh, there has been quite a lot of approaches based on fractional occupations that have been introduced over the years. Fractional occupations have been used by, for example, parameterize it directly into the Hartree-Fock energy expression and having sort of fractional occupations rather than the integer that you find in Hartree-Fock theory. Uh, and there are also, uh, for example, methods like uh, constrained pairing mean field theory where you get fractional occupations by, um, by sort of flipping the sign on the Hartree-Fock Bergoglio part of the, of the energy term so that you get a minimum which has fractional occupations. And usually all of these methods are going for fractional occupations because you want to get strong correlation into the uh, description. And the Hamiltonians they consider are uh, particle conserving and that means that you do, they enforce um, a given number of electrons either exactly by doing projections so you get the particle eigenstate or they add a Lagrangian just to make sure that you're, at least on average, your number of electrons is correct. But this is a very different sort of avenue than the one we have chosen, because this is the avenue of trying to get static correlation. They're trying to solve a different problem, static correlation for particle conserving systems. Whereas we're more trying to look at now how to start off with finding our uh, sort of starting point for open molecular systems. And, and for us, I mean, in this mean field description, we don't need to get the static correlation in there. I mean, what, what we will do is to put correlated models on top, just like you have for closed systems, you have Hartree-Fock, and then you have post hartree methods. And that's the hierarchy that we're going for. So just uh, short about how we do the wave function optimization. Uh, in contrast to Hartree-Fock, we now have also these occupation angles, so the wave function parameters that determine the, uh, the, um, uh, the elements of the density matrices. Uh, and since we have to do simul well, we don't have to, but we of course want to do simultaneous optimization of orbitals and these occupation angles, so occupations, uh, we have uh, implemented a second order trust region method to do this uh, optimization and that works. Uh, it's very robust and works quite well. I think uh, this is also what people have been implementing for similar problems like MCSCF and so on. But there's uh, no free lunch in a, in, in a sense because now that we vary occupations and allow occupations to deviate from integer, it means that when you rotate between orbitals, which have small changes in occupation, you get slow convergence of orbitals. And I believe this is the same problem that they are seeing in, in RDMFT and the other similar theories. It's, it's, I think it's something you can't get out of once you're changing your occupations and occupations can have small changes. But that motivates an active space formulation where it's an active space, meaning that there's only a subset of the orbitals that will be fractionally occupied and particle serving to be the particle breaking part. And although one might say that makes computational life a lot easier, it's also, uh, it's also quite physical because if you think about core electrons, uh, you wouldn't really want 
uh, you, in real life, you wouldn't really want to see core electrons exchanging with the environment or going uh, to and from the environment. Uh, also, highlighting virtuals would probably not be so important for uh, the problem at hand. Uh, but I will not talk about the active space formulation today, so I'm going to show some preliminary results, but it, it's all for a full space. But let's start first with results for a particle conserving Hamiltonian. So what happens if we treat a closed system with this particle breaking Hartree-Fock model? So I put it up here together with results also for Hartree-Fock to sort of show how the two methods are somewhat the same, but not exactly. Because if you did Hartree-Fock for, let's say, that you didn't know that uh, acetone wants to be neutral, and you, you enforce the charge on input to be dicationic, then you do your Hartree-Fock optimization, and what you'll get is a state where the orbital serves you the minimum energy for this charged state. If we do the same setup for particle breaking uh, Hartree-Fock, then the optimization will take you to a Hartree-Fock state but it's the neutral one, because uh, particle breaking Hartree-Fock can change the number of electrons. So it's going from one particle eigenstate to another through fractional occupations. And so in both these cases, since we're using a closed system Hamiltonian, these two are re uh, represented by Hartree-Fock solutions with integer occupations, but in the particle breaking Hartree-Fock, it's also a minimum with respect to uh, to changing uh, the, um, the occupations. So if you want to look at a simple picture and uh, an open system, uh, we have made just a simple parameterization of the environment through this parameter that enters the particle breaking Hamiltonian, where one can think of this parameter as something that is a junk box uh, containing now everything that has to do with interaction with the environment, so both the electronic interaction strength, but also the ability of the system to be reduced while the environment is oxidized and vice versa. Um, and, and that is um, uh, essentially if there will be no exchange of particles if the system really doesn't want to have an electron and the environment really doesn't want to give an electron, of course there's, there is a very uh, low, um, st uh, low probability of that. And now that we have the particle breaking Hamiltonian, we get fractional occupations and the average number of electrons of the system we look at may be increased or decreased. So now we're just going to look at an uh, example to how the occupations of this wave function change with the strength of this uh, parameter uh, and in the sort of uh, to be in line with the typical uh, theorist I've chosen uh, H2 in a minimal basis to illustrate this uh, because I think it's uh, really nice to have a simple picture of how things uh, how things are working so H2 in a minimal basis has only two orbitals you have HOMO and you have LUMO and HOMO and LUMO are now sort of designation based on the closed reference that we use, which in which HOMO has two electrons and LUMO has zero. So if we add this um, particle breaking part of the perturbation, then um, for the LUMO, but not for the HOMO, we can see that the number of electrons starting from two, if this strength of it is going towards zero, increasing the strength of it makes us go up to a state which has three electrons. So this perturbation of the LUMO, if it's strong enough, will fill, will gradually occupy, half occupy the LUMO and going from a two electron state to an average three electron state. We could do the same to see what happens if we perturb ho HOMO but not LUMO. And here we see that in the limit of that uh, coupling is, is very weak. You start out with the two electron state that you have. As you increase the coupling, then uh, the number of electrons, is, average number of electrons is reduced to one. So you're basically half emptying uh, HOMO to a one electron state. If you now, per se, that's what would be a um, more sensible thing to do, perhaps, to have a 
the environment couples to both orbitals, this is what happens. And that's the same strength here for simplicity. As you increase the strength, there is sort of a dip, small dip in the number of electrons from 2 to 1.96 on average, and then going back up to 2. But what is happening here? Because in this limit, there is a particle conserving solution, but it's not in this limit. So let's look at the occupations. So what happens is, is um, you're actually emptying HOMO, half emptying HOMO, while half filling LUMO. So you have one plus one electron is two, and two plus zero electrons is two. So in, in here, you have the Hartree-Fox solution with doubly occupied HOMO and empty LUMO, but in this limit here, what you have is uh, actually a linear combination of zero different two electron and four electron term, which has on average, uh, which has on average two electrons. So it's a very, very different wave function out here than in here. Um, yeah. So that is that is just to see how occupations respond to this perturbation, particle breaking perturbation. One can, of course, construct a little bit more interesting toy models, uh, which is here from uh, uh, from looking at uh, we're looking at the one for benzene dithiol, but I've here only plotted the homo and lumo of it, and uh, we have some environment that we interact with, and then we have essentially a coupling to that environment, which has a given strength, and then there is the probability uh, of uh, ionization of the system where as the probability correlated with the energetics of accepting that electron in the environment and vice versa. So in this system A here, there is a, a high sort of probability of getting electron from the environment, whereas in B it it's maybe wants to give out in terms of energetics between the different systems. And that is what we see here is that you get an average which is the increased number of electrons, because in this case, you sort of have a higher probability of filling, whereas in this case, there is a higher probability of draining electrons. Then, um, <clears throat> so that was that for, the, for this uh, mean field closed shell uh, wave function. Uh, we're at the very beginning of uh, talking uh, or talking and developing response theory, I have a PhD student, Bendik, who has just started doing that. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, sort of our thoughts on how we start on this. And uh, there is uh, a lot to learn then from open systems. Uh, like a lot of work has been done in physics for open systems. And in contrast to when we just looked at the static picture for just a ground state Hamiltonian, if we want to do response, we cannot just trace out the Hamiltonian. We have to have it uh, in our equations. And this state will have some density, uh, like this full system will have some density uh, rho associated with it. So what we're going to do is to work with projected densities where we have a density that projects down to a system density in a direct product with the environment density, and then sort of the rest of it, sort of a correlation between those two, uh, between those two systems. And for simplicity, I see they do this also in, in, um, uh, in physics, is to just assume that this row B of the environment is essentially in uh, initial state of the environment and that it's in thermal equilibrium and has infinite degrees of freedom and so on. So that is uh, our starting point and that goes back to using a familiar equation but in now we sort of get two equations with two uh, unknowns. We have to also solve this or set in the solutions for this into the equations to get the time development of the density in the system that we're actually interested in. So that gives some additional uh, complications and some uh, different uh, equations than what we uh, usually have. 
but in essence, I think it, we haven't done this yet, so these are my thoughts, but I think it, it seems to be possible to formulate it consistent with response theory for closed systems. We get some extra terms that depend on the environment, uh, and these extra terms um, could look a lot like this. Uh, they have in physics the uh, Lim Limbladian master equations, which I think can also, in some sense, you can see the similarities to damped response theory. And with that formulation, the system can be open to electron exchange, which is, is sort of what we're interesting, interested in. Uh, but it's also or could be also be just energy transfer in general. Um, and uh, it can, of course, easily be then extended to perturbing the molecular system. So if you want to, for example, do optical properties of your system or other, uh, or other properties, you can sort of add that uh, to the Hamiltonian uh, perturbation that works only in that system. So in summary, I hope that um, it's come across that electronic structure theory for open molecular systems is uh, an exciting, although for us ra rather new now with these wave function developments. So we don't really have uh, that many uh, final applications to show you, but I think that uh, uh, there is enough examples of possibilities where we can use it that piqued my interest. So, uh, so we will be continuing along these lines. And I want to acknowledge uh, my PhD student, Regina. She's been working on this uh, for, for a year or two now. Uh, and uh, together with uh, Sarai, uh, a postdoc in a different group at Antanu, uh, we did this uh, closed shell particle breaking Hartree Fock. And now we have Bendik in the mix who started looking to uh, response theory and also couple cluster theory. And then I want to also want to thank there is the Dirk Koy from Amsterdam for stimulating discussion as well as Anders Lerwick from Antanu. He's doing non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So we're sort of at the point of discussing where, where we can see interesting applications of this, uh, this type of approaches. And of course, the Research Council of Norway for Money and Center of, uh, for Advanced Study in Norway for, uh, for uh, money for collaborations with these people. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ida Maria. Uh, now we're open for the questions. Do we have a mic uh, in the back? No? Oh, probably either here. Thank you. That was very interesting. I, I was just wondering, maybe you, you specify it and I missed it, but as you vary the, the electron number, what, what is the spin state? What about the spin of? Yeah, I didn't uh, actually, it's good you ask. I didn't mention, but uh, as we have, um, uh, as we have here, uh, we are, uh, it's the, the wave function is always in a singlet spin state. But uh, the spin state of the wave function is something that we have to especially deal with starting with, uh, with the open shell and, uh, it, and whether one wants to actually enforce a given spin state of the system or not depends very much on what the Hamiltonian commutes with. Because if the Hamiltonian does not commute with the spin operators, there's no reason to be in that eigenstate. Uh, but as we're doing now open shell uh, formulations, we're doing uh, the open shell in such a way that sort of the particle conserving limit is this uh, restricted open shell uh, approach that uh, Skuseria uh, and Tsuchimochi has, uh, has presented. So basically solving UHF equations, but then getting the ROHF orbitals in the end. So, well, thank you for this new type of approach. And I mean, it seems a little bit semi-empirical. I mean, how do you determine uh, how much charge should flow and between the systems? 
Yes, so uh, as we did it now, we just did it in a simple parameterized way, but this, the value of this, um, uh, like when you, this, this part of the Hamiltonian, here it's just set up parametrically, but you can actually derive equations on it from starting out with the closed system and, uh, and subspace partitionings. So you can drive it and get a little bit more correct form. Uh, for instance, uh, it could be related to, uh, if, you look at, uh, uh, if you look at just uh, not the closed shell, but an open shell we where you have one particle operator that is creation or annihilation, then you could sort of show that the parameters that you have in here are essentially products of wave function weights in your full CI expansion that goes down to how much the system likes to be reduced, whereas the environment is oxidized and vice versa. So you can, you can sort of start with the FCI expression for, uh, for the state to, to sort of get out the physical meaning of how to parameterize this, uh, the parameters correctly. And as it is here, it's just one parameter and you set it and you do the calculation. But of course, if you do, um, if you do, when we start doing actual applications, there will probably likely be a self-consistency in also determining those parameters because as you optimize your state and change the state, so should the interaction with the environment change. So, so the, the, um, the exact form of the Hamiltonian and what it contains is, is sort of quite quite complicated for open systems. It's not like for closed systems where you just take this guy and then apply it with the whatever wave function. You also need to, to basically develop expressions for your perturbation parts. Uh, okay, so we have several questions. This, this is really useful. Uh, I was thinking about typical place would be when you do QMMM calculations and, and you have this partitioning of, you have X electrons over in the QM system and, and Y over in the molecular mechanics and you don't have the flexibility. Uh, have you sort of looked into how this picture could be evolved into a QMMM where you would allow a flow of electrons between the two different environments? Uh, it's a it's a very uh, very good remark because uh, we've been thinking about it. But I've uh, it's basically been uh, me and my PhD students, and I've been partially on maternity leave, so we haven't uh, started all uh, sort of annus. But that's definitely one of the things that we have had in mind, both with respect to QMMM, but also I think uh, a lot of QM QM schemes would benefit from looking at it as two coupled open systems. All right, thanks a lot. It was a very entertaining talk, I must say. I was, my mind drifted away a little bit towards the Nobel Prize and, and, and who knows what's going to come for you in the future. Um, but, but, uh, and, and I was thinking about these hidden variable theories. I mean, if one can, because now you truly have a quantum entangled state with different number of particles. Whereas Einstein thought perhaps that at, um, at one point that, I mean, the state has one or, or the other, you just don't know until you measure, and then when you measure, you, 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 you know. But, but does that make a difference here? Because when you look at observables, you go into response theory, for instance, um, what, is, what is the best description of the system? Would it be kind of a, a, an average of, of two different kind of states, more like a classical average? Or is this really a true thing that, that you shall have this quantum entanglement when you propagate your system? Do you have any kind of reflection on that? Um, I have reflections, but I wish I had the answer. But, uh, but uh, I mean, the thing is, as it is now, we have to, I mean, there is one fundamental thing that is quite clear, and that is here that if you have two systems, two open systems can only couple to closed systems if there is correlation. For mean field direct product states, that is not possible. So sort of the correlation of electrons or entanglement of states come in there. But uh, uh, for now, I think that we would be happy just trying to, to see if we can get something useful of this. For example, for let's say we want to look at the molecules or atoms on surfaces, how much charge do they acquire and things like this. 
it's hopefully maybe a simplistic way, but maybe it can be an efficient way to describe these kind of, uh, of things, Ra rather than as we usually do in wave function theory, we limit us to cells to n electrons, and then we can never go beyond that part of, of Fox space. So, but, so I don't know, but uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, thing. Thanks a lot. So we have a couple of hands. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you have any, when you do this subsystem decomposition of, of properties, do you have any ambiguity appearing there? Because I, I just recall from doing polarizable embedding that it is not very clear sort of how to define subsystem properties. Is that similar challenges that you have? I mean, that's always the, the problem, right? As long as you have something that is uh, covalently bonded, for example, if you have, if you think about this molecular electronics example I showed with your molecular junction, then you have a molecule that is covalently bonded to some, for example, let's say gold electrodes or uh, graphene or whatever, but then of the decomposition would then depend on also if you include the description of some of your environment atoms in, in a sense. So uh, what, what I would do as, uh, with my background, I would uh, always just look at uh, sort of decomposing an initial electron density uh, or uh, doing the local orbitals or something like that. But, but partitioning systems is not easy. It's of course easier if there is no covalent bond. So if you have a, a just a subsystem in, interacting with some surface or something. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that we will have to consider for a given application, which makes sort of this, this Hamiltonian part here is a sort of a topic of its own in this type of theories. So you, you move away from only trying to approximate the wave function to also having to deal with, uh, with the Hamiltonian. Uh, so maybe I just misunderstood your, uh, one of your slides. So when you spoke about the acetone, did you have an environment here when it changed? Charge? No, no, uh, no, uh, let's see, find it. Uh, that was uh, sort of the point here that this is a this is a closed system. We only have the acetone in isolation, and our wave function and energy expression tells us that when we do a particle breaking Hartree-Fock optimization of that type of state, you get the Hartree-Fock solution, as you should, because it should be a particle conserving wave function when you have a particle conserving operator. The thing here was just to highlight the differences because Hartree-Fock can never change your electron number. But particle breaking Hartree-Fock can pass through fractional states. So if it says that, oh, the user here, you should not put two plus on input, it should be neutral. But doesn't that depend on the potential of the electrons in some ways? Like, hmm? Doesn't that depend on the potential of the electrons? Like if I, if I think of it as a reaction between acetone two plus and two electrons, give the neutral species. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is, you're thinking about where does the electron comes from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in, in this case, we're looking at this acetone is a closed system, and now we're tr trying to find the sort of uh, the best energetic description in terms of this wave function for it. But uh, would that correspond to electron that is also zero potential, kind of? Yeah, yeah, this is just, there is no interaction, and, and usually uh, we know what number of electrons is on input, so, uh, so this is, this is just to sort of, this is just a fun fact to highlight the differences between the two, but uh, often we, we, we do know what number of electrons we're dealing with. Uh, but this is just showing how, how they work in different ways, although the end result could be the same. If you started from the neutral state, the state you end up with would be exactly the same. So do we have other questions? 